This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this episode of Crimes and Consequences. Thank you so much for listening to us or watching us on True Crime Daily. Uh, we'd like to ask you to hit the subscribe or follow or like button or whatever, whatever positive thing you can do. Right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, how are you? I'm doing okay. You are? I am. Am I getting you stressed out? <laughs> Getting her stressed out, running no, a little late. Fantastic! I'm always good. <laughs> You're not, <laughs> not fantastic and always good. Are you ready for some true crime? Yes. Okay, so this case actually is from Michigan, and you heard about it. It's was it happened not far from my home, and it's a really tragic case. I'm not going to say the last names of the victim or the perpetrator, to respect the family. Okay. But it's a very interesting case. And with that, are you ready? Yes. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about it. It's, it's about March 13th of 2016, and the parents of Stephen, we're going to call him Stephen Christopher, they walked into the police station to file a missing persons report. Stephen was 19. And it had been three days since they last saw him. He wasn't answering his cell phone. And he'd never been gone that long without talking to them. Suzanne and Michael, his parents, they reached out to all his friends. You know, where do you know what's going on? Have have you seen Steven? And nobody seemed to see him since March 10th. Been, oh, yeah. So it's been a few days. It's been three days. Yeah. So the evening of March 10th seemed a very normal evening to Stephen's parents. There was nothing unusual. Stephen was at home. His sister was there. His dad worked the day shift. And so he would get home. Well, I'm sorry. It's the afternoon shift. So he didn't get home until like one o'clock at night. And Stephen was there when his dad got home, and they're talking when Stephen was in bed. He was actually laying on the couch, and he was just on his phone, just like a 19-year-old right. does. Or a 52-year-old. Or... <laughs> or, <yeah. laughs> I'm always right. scrolling my right. phone. Suzanne woke up in the morning, and it's about 6 o'clock, and when she did... There's no Steven. According to the records, and we got the records for this case. We did a FOIA request, and we got the court transcripts and all the documents for this case. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you is based on actual court records. Or testimony or evidence that testimony, was submitted. evidence, exactly. So I know that some people dispute some of the information, but this was all from the court. Okay. That's all we know. And what that's we go the by. facts we're going with. The, according to records, the last time Stephen had contact with somebody was at 2.30 a.m. on, I guess it would be The March, 11th. Yeah, yeah, the 11th. And he'd FaceTimed his friend, Andrew. Andrew and him were best friends. And then mom wakes up at 6 a.m. and he's gone. It appeared as if he willingly left the house, but he didn't take any clothes with him. He didn't take any belongings, nothing that demonstrated he's going to be gone. He just wasn't there. So he said, there's records that show at 2.30 he FaceTimed his friend Andrew 
the next day, his phone was pinged in Detroit. And this is about 40 minutes from where they lived. They lived in a suburb of Detroit. You know this. Yes. Not in Detroit. Right. But his phone pinged in Detroit. And then after that, through the records, we know that it pinged in a place called Sterling Heights, which is where we're located right now. Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say, we're in Sterling Heights yes. right now. And that was about 20 minutes after that. And then there was just nothing. No more pinging, nothing. Desperate to find their son because time is going on. Suzanne and Michael, they contacted the news, and the newspapers ran the story locally. And I saw it. I saw, they ended up doing posters of him missing. And they were really concerned, is he dead or alive? And I'll explain why in a little bit. And they reached out during the news, and they were like, please come home. Stephen, everybody wants to see you. Everybody misses you. Please come home. Again, they reached out to friends. Nobody knows. They did Crime Stoppers and offered a reward for information on his disappearance. The police ended up becoming so concerned that they interviewed his friends and even acquaintances. And nobody had hmm. any information as to where he was. And then the trail went cold. This is a 19-year-old. Yeah. Maybe he ran away. Maybe he committed suicide. That's what some people are thinking. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about Stephen. In many ways, he was your, your typical 19-year-old. He was six feet tall. He was thin. He was a, an attractive young man. He was great at art. And he loved to play the drums. He collected vinyl records. You know people that... Oh, my daughter yeah. does. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he hung out with his friends, just like a normal 19-year-old. But there were other things that made Stephen different. He was diagnosed at a young age with Asperger's syndrome and bipolar. So he had these mood swings. And as you know, oftentimes when people have are diagnosed with mental illness, compliance is a problem, right? Yep, compliance with medication. They're not taking their medication. Right. Yeah, and so sometimes he wouldn't. And when he didn't, he could allegedly become violent. The police were called to Stephen's family's home sometimes when these episodes happened, allegedly. For example, in 2014, the police were dispatched to Stephen's house because he was being very aggressive. Now, again, these are from police reports, and some family members and people might dispute the accuracy of the police reports, but they were called because he was refusing to go to school and he got in his dad's face. And they were hit, Stephen and his dad were wrestling on the floor. His mom explained to the police that he hadn't taken his medicine, and that was why he was acting out. Prior to that, though, his mental illness seemed to be somewhat under control. He had been involuntarily committed to a psychiatric uh, ward of a hospital um, just to get his medicine adjusted. And I don't want to make it look like I am blaming the victim, because I am not. I am just going through some of Stephen's past. In 2015, he was arrested along with a friend named Kyle for larceny. Um, they had been suspected of breaking into cars, which... A lot of kids do. A lot of kids do. That just happened you know. in your neighborhood, yep. right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In my neighborhood, some kids were caught on camera and broke into my husband's truck and i mean not that i'm condoning it but it happens it happens it happens teenagers you know i i kids, I, I, I fucked I, up yeah i get it times, so. i get it not, I'm not again i'm not, not judging it. i'm not judging no, no absolutely not, judging. not but 
Yeah, not that it's right. No, it's, defi- it's definitely. <laughs> but it happens. It's, it's definitely a, wrong. It's definitely wrong. But teenage angst. So yeah. on another incident, it was July 22nd, and this is 2015. Steven is out with his best friend, Andrew, and they're sitting in an Andrew's Jeep, and the lights are off. They're on the side of the road. They were all dressed in black, and they had with them medical gloves. Like rubber gloves? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the police were trying to figure out, like, what are you doing? And they told the police, we're going to get some ice cream. And uh, it's okay. like four something in, in, in the, the morning. morning. Yes. I also want to know that his be- Stephen's best friend, Andrew, had mental health issues, too, which we'll get into. One of them was Asperger's syndrome. So they both were mm-hmm. okay. They both were on the spectrum of autism, yes. and they actually met at a special at a school for children oh. with things with issues in elementary. Oh, okay. so they'd been friends for ten years, and they were very close. They did end up that day getting arrested for uh, larceny of a vehicle, and when the police looked into the jeep they discovered that there was a black knife oh and there were some skulls i don't know what they weren't human skulls right. i don't they weren't human skulls i don't know what they were police ended up releasing steven uh into the custody of his parents and he was forbidden from hanging out with andrew for a little bit he stayed with his uncle uh because she, his mom thought that his uncle might be a positive influence on him. Now, this is disputed. This is, again, only from the court records that while Stephen was staying with his uncle in New Jersey, he ran away. Um, and they found some marijuana pipes and eventually, long story short, Stephen comes back. His per- his uncle ended up personally driving him back mm. to Michigan because he couldn't control Stephen. Stephen was not a bad kid. It's just the medicine trying to, you know, trying to yeah. tweak it, trying to get it the way it's supposed to be. Right. And it's a guessing game when you're dealing with medication sometimes. And I mean, I've personally gone through it too. You know what I mean? So, especially with children. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. How they grow up and yeah. go through their teens and all of that. So, it's, it's really sad. But in general, he was a very nice kid. When he got back home, he placed stickers all over his mom's mirror and he threw some coats out and clothing and he emptied some of her drawers and he wrote, bitch and weed on his mom's wall and pot on the door. But again, he wasn't taking his medicine. These aren't violent actions. He, well, he did punch a hole in the wall. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Excuse me. (laughs) And knocked over the television. Mm. Um, The the police ended up um, arresting him for that. And it's it's just very sad for me because the mom and the dad, they tried really hard. Um, to help him. According to a police report, Suzanne told the police that she'd enrolled Stephen in, in, every, in every program she could think of. I mean, she did everything to help. And I believe she was a nurse. It could be wrong, but I believe she was a nurse. And he was just out of control. And at one point, he said he wanted to fucking die. Please take me to the hospital. And he was put in the back of a police car, and he was rocking back and forth and shaking. He was screaming. He was hyperventilating. So they ended up calling EMS, and he was taken to the hospital. And eventually, of course, they got his medicine tweaked, and there were more incidences of him having outbursts when he wasn't on his medicine. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of the things, but there were multiple attempts or threats of suicide. Um, they found 15 of his pills missing one oh. time, and he was mumbling 
incoherently slurring his words on the floor. Uh, EMS had to come. He was very agitated, and he had to be held down. And then he was taken to the hospital. Well, with this background, I mean, I understand now the extreme concern his parents felt. When he's missing. When he's missing, absolutely. So now Stephen's an adult. His parents end up getting awarded guardianship over him. You know right how that works adult guardianship yeah adult guardianship and that gave them more control over steven and more avenues that they could see you know use to help him and guardianships are for medical decisions yeah 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 yeah. so now we're back to march 10th is the last time he's seen by march 13th his family is just beyond Consolable. They know something, something bad has happened. They go to Crime Stoppers. I told you they went to the news. They registered uh, uh, Stephen on the um, NamUs. Okay. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. National Registry of I don't know missing persons. I don't know what name. Yeah, at NamUs. It's a great place to go if you have someone you love that's missing. And he was put there. There was a reward. They had a GoFundMe page. They did everything. And they put out thousands of missing persons posters. I saw them in stores, grocery stores, um, everywhere. And that's why this this case really touches me. They did everything they could do. But I said it grew cold. And it wasn't until 13 months after he was gone that they got their first the police got their first tip 13 months tanya 13 months agonizing agonizing for everybody who knew him and loved him because i can't even imagine as a parent you remember me talking about oh yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i remember this case yeah it was a tip from an 18 year old girl named cc she was a young woman, and she'd been talking. So you got to follow me. There's Cece. She's talking to her friend, Yvette. And, and Yvette confided in her that she knew Stephen was dead. Oh, boy. And where he was and how he got there. Let me tell you a little bit about Yvette. At the time of Stephen's disappearance, she was 17 years old. She was a 10th grader. She did online high school classes, and she lived with her boyfriend at her parents' house. Her boyfriend was Andrew. Stephen's best best friend. friend. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-oh. She met Stephen uh, maybe 10 times through her boyfriend, Andrew. So Cece goes to the police, and I'll tell you what, Cece, I mean— says she has some more details but it was actually cc talked to a vet and then cc told her dad and her dad made her go Mm. with him to the police and this is a very disturbing case um let me give you some background more on a vet she'd been dating andrew for two years he seemed very jealous of Stephen. And on multiple occasions, he would accuse a vet of sleeping with Stephen, which was completely unfounded. I mean, not even mildly accurate. But Andrew became very jealous. One time, he even drove to a vet's house. Wait, scratch that. He drove to Stephen's parents' house mm. and... He made a vet go up to the door and ask some of Stephen's family members if they recognized a vet. Are you kidding? He wanted to see if a vet had been there. That's like if there really was secretly weird. something, right? Secretly something going on. Yeah, like she's going to Stephen's house and hanging out, and and I don't know exactly how the family reacted, but I know the answer was no. We don't know who a vet is. On the night of March 10th, that's the last time Stephen's seen, Andrew and Vet 
Andrew and Yvette got into a fight over two things. One was about whether Yvette was sleeping with Steven. Again, this mm-hmm. argument. And the other was about her going on this vacation to Florida to visit a friend. Because he's getting controlling, right? Mm-hmm. Yvette stated she went to bed about 9 o'clock, which just seems awfully early for a, a teen. <laughs> for a young, yeah, for a teenager. And when she went to bed, Andrew was laying beside her. She woke up at 3 a.m. and there was no Andrew. She's like, hmm. She went back to sleep. When she woke up in the morning, Andrew was back at the house. She asked him, where, where were you? Like, where, where were you at mm-hmm. at three in the morning? Like, this is weird, right? And he told her that he picked up Stephen and they hung out at a gas station. And then he dropped Stephen off back at Stephen's house. And then he came home. And then that next day, Yvette went to Florida. When she, it was when she got back that she learned that Stephen was missing. It was, there was a conversation maybe a week or two after Yvette got back. Andrew asked Yvette, how would you feel if Stephen was dead? What the fuck? I know that's, what is that supposed to what mean? What the fuck does that mean? Right. Great. Yeah. Oh, no. I would. Yeah. I'd be so happy. No. Why? why? What kind of answer is she like, supposed to give? What are you asking give? me this yeah. for? Why? Why would you ask me that? He told. Andrew told her. That he was a tech guy for the mafia. That Andrew was a tech guy from the mafia. For, for the mafia. He okay. worked for the mafia. The mafia. the mafia. He helped them with computers, surveillance, technical things. And he's oh, you what? always do that funny face. And he's 19? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that Stephen saw things on the computer that he shouldn't have seen. And Andrew was ordered to kill him by the mafia. Okay. Of that, I mean, she's like. Are you for real? Idea. This is Are you for real? Come on. Come, Come on. on. Come me. on. He told her that on March 10th, Stephen FaceTimed him, which we know is true. And that the last time was 3.17 a.m. When Stephen asked him to come pick him up at around 3.30. So they could check out a place called Nancy's Grave. Let me tell you a little bit about Nancy's Grave. You, you have to understand this area. It's rural. You know. Yep. I live there. Um. And Nancy's grave is this area in the woods that's considered haunted. There's not actually a grave there. It's Hmm. just called Nancy's grave. And so you have Andrew telling Yvette that they went to Nancy's grave. Just for shits and giggles. Yeah. And so it's out in the country. And then you have to go through the woods to this area and teens went there, urban legend, whatever, mm. Nancy's grave. It's not that far from Andrew's home. It's maybe five miles because he lived out in the country. When they went there, that's when Andrew found this opportunity to kill his best friend. Apparently, Andrew parked his car, and suggested to Stephen, leave your vape and your cell phone in the car, and Stephen did. Stephen didn't know that Andrew had a twenty-two caliber gun with a Russian revolver and a hoister, holster, Um, holster, holster, and they began walking through this wooded field uh, they're looking for nancy's grave there is no nancy's grave okay right. but they're looking it's about they're about 200 yards in or so and it's about a 10 minute walk because it's dark we're talking the middle of the night you're walking through the woods i mean it's still about 10 minutes and they're walking and then andrew ends up 
stating that he shot Stephen once in the stomach and twice in the back. That's his best friend. I know. Right? For no reason. Like, no reason. No reason. I don't understand. He's jealous. Yeah. A vet didn't believe him because, number one, the mafia story is... It's stupid. It's stupid. It's stupid. It's, it's ridiculous. And then she didn't think Andrew was capable of killing anybody and... They're best friends. Right. Like, this is Why your best you friend. This? this is your best friend. Andrew told Yvette, I can prove to you this is true. So it's May. It's less than two months after Stephen disappeared. And Andrew drove Yvette to the location out in the country. And according to Yvette, Andrew had his brother's gun in his hand and he forced her to walk with him into the woods she said it took about 10 to 15 minutes and then laying on his back was the decomposing body Aww. of steven and she described it as a a grisly oh, sight and this is going to be graphic his jaw was missing Aww. and his skin had turned black they looked at the body for a little while, and then they left the woods. But that wasn't the last time they went and saw Stephen's body. In fact, what happens only gets worse. Only gets more and more graphic. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's horrible. It's, 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 it's poor parents. It's shitty. About a, a month after the first time a vet went out there, they went back to the woods where Stephen's body laid. Only this time, they brought with them a duffel bag oh. and an axe. But it's one of the axes that have, like, what is it, a pickaxe. Like, there's a... Okay, like a sharp end? It's got the pick end in one end. Yeah. Why would you bring that? Well... Seriously, I'm though. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's it's not right. funny. It, no. But, it, no. But no. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. He wanted, Andrew wanted to be able to move Stephen's body, mm -hmm. but he knew it was still too heavy. So oh. um, it was easier to do it if the body was in pieces. So dismembered him with mm -hmm. a pickaxe? Mm -hmm. Well, he wanted to cut it in two. So it's an axe. Yeah, there's one end that's an yeah. axe. Yeah. yeah. But first, he took Stephen's watch off his wrist, and he kept it for himself, like a souvenir, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Like a souvenir. Mm -hmm. Andrew gave the axe to a vet, and he tells her to swing at Stephen's pelvic region. She misses. I'm sure she's all shades of fucked up, right? Right. I... What the hell? I mean, what's going through your mind standing there? I would just be, I, I, I mean, I'm sure. I need to call the police. I need to, well, I need to right. get the hell out of here and I've never seen my boyfriend yeah, again. Yeah, exactly. So she misses and it, it takes her a couple times she misses. Andrew takes the axe from her and he swings it about 10 times. Now the body is in two pieces. He grabs Stephen's belt loop, belt loop, mm -hmm. and Yvette grabs Stephen's pant leg, and they place his the lower half of his body in the duffel bag. Okay. Yvette says she remembers seeing Stephen's skull in the duffel bag, but she doesn't remember seeing Andrew chop it off. Okay. But he did. <sighs> okay. Andrew also threw in a few loose bones because time had gone by into the bag. And he did break down for a minute. He, he, he was telling Yvette, this is my best friend. I can't do this. I can't do this. And to Yvette, he seemed generally sad. But it didn't stop. He him. still did it. Mm -hmm. He still did it. They ended up carrying the duffel bag and placed it into Andrew's trunk. trunk. And now remember, this is about a 10-minute walk. The whole process, according to Yvette, took about 45 minutes. Okay. And then the couple take 
this duffel bag with the body out of Andrew's car, and they ended up putting it into the trunk of Yvette's car because Yvette didn't have a license or a license plate, so they weren't able to drive her car. They had... Wait, hold on. Sorry. If that didn't have a license or a license plate, they weren't able to drive a car. Let's scratch that. Okay. So we're going to go back to the whole process took about 45 minutes. They put the duffel bag into the trunk of a car and they end up realizing, okay, this is a really bad idea to keep a body yeah. in the trunk of a car. You think? You think? And it's been, but it ends up being in the trunk for a couple days. What? Yeah. A couple days. They leave it there? Well, they don't know what to do. They leave him They there? don't know what to do. Well, uh, they don't know what to do. Oh, my God. Why'd they put him in the bag in the first place? I mean, I, uh, maybe they you were need afraid to, to think th- ahead here. You, you thought ahead enough to bring a bag to right. put him in. Right. But Jesus. But, oh, my God. Um. They went back to Andrew's house, and there, when Yvette was there, there was Stephen's vape and also the watch he had taken a month early. And an alarm would go off once a day, and Andrew had set it for the time that Stephen died. Oh, geez. Are you kidding me? The couple went back to the scene for a third time. But this time, Yvette says she stayed in the car, and Andrew went to the rest of the body. Because they didn't take all the body, Oh, my remember? God. They, they didn't take... Oh, my God. They remember? only took part of him? Yes, because it's a duffel bag. Oh. It was a month or two when Yvette's trunk, because they put it in Yvette, Yvette's trunk. Just, she wasn't Like when they driving. got it back home yes, or she wasn't. Yeah, she wasn't driving. Her car didn't have a license plate. So they noticed the smell. And Andrew and Yvette weren't getting along. Oh, no. He kicked her out of the house. That's. But Yvette wasn't going to leave with his body in her trunk. Uh -uh. So Yvette and Andrew decided it was time to bury part of Stephen's lower torso. They went to Home Depot. They bought a bucket and they bought some, what is it, quick dry cement? Is that oh, what that okay. is? I guess. It's cement that, yeah, you know, that dries you make quickly. Your own yeah. Cement. You mix it yeah. and, yeah. During the day, while Andrew's parents were working, Andrew decided to bury parts of Stephen's body in his parents' backyard. Oh my God. This house is out in the country, so there's not any close neighbors by. And it has a very long front yard Mm -hmm. with a kind of a long driveway. And so it's a brick house. It's actually four acres of land. So they have four four acres of land. And I know because everything out there is just land. Well, I live right down the road. Don't forget that. Andrew grabbed some shovels and together with a vet, they lowered... Uh, they took Stephen's lower body and they put it into a, a children's wagon, like the little, like oh my the God. little, what what the, the rider, fuck? the rider. Yes. Like the little red wagon. And Yvette was crying as they were digging this hole. She says that Andrew made her do it. And I mean, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt because yeah. I really don't see why she would want to be no, involved me either. in, in I mean, any of that. She, she's I mean, kind of roped into this. Yeah. I mean. She's, yeah, she's. She's kind of stuck now. Yeah. They open up the duffel bag and rolled out part of Stephen into the hole. And then they poured cement on it and they covered it with dirt. Stephen's skull, they filled it with cement. Oh, why? And then they buried it in a different area of the property along the fence line. That's... This is so horrible. It's so, so horrible. horrible. And I feel bad for Stephen's family. And I feel bad for Andrew's oh, family. Oh, absolutely. This I is mean, so messed up. I mean, what the? 
What the hell? I know. Like, Andrew started a fire and they ended up throwing the duffel bag and some of the gloves they used into this mm-hmm. fire. And it wasn't long after that that the couple broke up. It wasn't good for their you know, relationship. Yeah, yeah um, um, a murder probably would do. We have yeah. a little bit of a strain on someone's relationship. Good Lord. Yeah, and if you can do that to your best friend. I what, know. What could you do to me? Exactly. So they broke up. But she didn't go to the police because she was afraid mm-hmm. of Andrew. And he'd taken her ID and he threatened to frame her for the murder. I mean, I sort of can't blame her i mean what is she like 17 18 years old yeah it's yeah. and plus part of her started to believe he might actually be part of the mafia oh. at first it seems stupid but then i guess if things happen you start and you hear it enough you start mm. to believe it was only when she ended up telling cc that his body steven's body was found Yvette had been interviewed before. Because remember I told you the police interviewed oh, yeah, acquaintances, right. friends. And Andrew had been interviewed many times. That's his best friend. So, of course, they're going to they're gonna interview Andrew. Um, but nothing, you know, nothing led them to actually believe that Andrew would do it. After they broke up, Andrew would send Yvette threats reminding her about the mafia. She ended up blocking him on her social media, which is a big deal. When, yeah. you're, when you're blocked, when you're ghosted, yeah. that made him very unhappy. So now she's went forward. She's told Cece. Cece's told her dad. His dad, her dad brought him, her, to the police. We're at April 27th of 2016. So it's been, been, thir- it's been like 13, 13 months. 13 months, yeah. That is when the police it, this, it, first arrested him. He'd spoken with them before, said, I know nothing about it. But they ended up issuing a warrant for his arrest. And they picked him up at 4 a.m. And at that point, he was at a rehab center because Andrew was having psychiatric problems, too. It's really important to understand Andrew's background to really get an idea of how he got to the point we're at. Andrew, I'm parched. <laughs> Andrew was put into foster care at the age of 22 months. 22 months. 22 months, okay. It, it was a result of abuse Aww. and neglect by his biological mother. His mother already had an older son that had been taken away. And adopted through the foster care system. The state reached out to Andrew's biological brother. And because he'd been adopted, they reached out to his adoptive parents. And they agreed to take Andrew, too. So now you have these two brothers that are being raised by the same adoptive parents. And his mother was a special education teacher assistant. So she was perfect for him because, mm-hmm. as you know, he had he had a lot he had a lot of issues. I mean, he was abused, right. neglected, and has Asperger's. He attended regular elementary school, but then he took classes at the learning center, it's called, and that's where he met Stephen. So they put them in regular school, but they also sent them away a couple hours a day to this learning center, and that's when they met. Andrew was a lot like Stephen. As I said, they both had Asperger's. Andrew had fetal alcohol syndrome. Oh. And he'd been, uh, in, he'd been institutionalized seven or eight times for psychiatric reasons throughout his childhood and teens. He attended therapy sessions. I mean, his just like Stephen's parents, they did everything they could to try to get give their kids the best life they could give with the issues that were going on with them. Every opportunity to help these boys was given. The end of the, so Stephen gets arrested. I'm sorry, Andrew gets arrested. They do a search warrant and that's when they find Stephen's watch. 
it was on this at that point it was on the center council of andrew's car why i don't know why and why does he want to be why? reminded of i don't know i don't know you got nothing nope i have nothing about that one that's a weird why would you want to be reminded I of know. what you did I like, know. Wh- that's, that's what i'm that's what i mean like like serial killers and stuff okay fine they get off on it or whatever whatever for with the, with their souvenirs and stuff but i'm i don't think that's the case here no i don't like either. maybe he I, maybe he wanted to remind himself because he of just, what he did yeah of what he did like like i'm such a bad person kind of like you know how sometimes you do that to yourself like you torture yourself over the bad things you've done i mean this is really bad but i mean like maybe maybe like, I, don't re- I don't know that's uh, that's my armchair psychology okay all right there. i, I don't, don't know that's don't the only know. thing we i can know. think of you don't know uh so police end up finding the gun that was used to kill steven in andrew's brother's room he had put it there not not andrew's brother andrew had put it there right i got it they search the property and he ends up showing them where the different body parts are they found steven's lower torso with his legs on the border of the family's four acre property they had to break through that thin layer of cement he had his jeans on and there was a, a keychain with a key mm. on it in his pocket and his wallet was there they found Steven's skull behind the garage. It's it's not an attached garage, it's like a carriage house, it, like a pole barn or something. Okay. It was encased in cement and buried, um, along with some of the other bones. It, hold on. it was encased and cemented, buried along with some other bones that were connected to the skull so the spinal yeah and some ribs oh there were some ribs to this day it hasn't been explained how his head was completely separated from his body because he didn't explain it and a vet said she didn't see him actually Mm. do that his upper torso including his vertebrae and some of his ribs and arms were found at nancy's grave so they had they left. never he never moved. Them. No, so that was one of the things is they had left oh. his body was scattered oh, in different this is spots. So it, it, it is it... Uh, anyway, a vet says she doesn't really know how her mind can't remember every detail, but she did point out when she was with the police that there was an axe hanging in that barn Mm. and that was the one that they had used to dismember Stephen. thank you yeah and then the little red rider wagon (sighs) so this is what an autopsy determined it's it's different than what andrew had said to a vet Stephen was shot in the face at close range through the eye yeah and then the back of the head both wounds would have caused instant death. Death. Both. It, they never. Oh, I'm sorry. I make mistakes sometimes. <laughs> they could never determine if he was actually shot in the stomach because of mm. decomposi- decomposition. Thank you. And as I said, a warrant was issued for Andrew's arrest. They picked him up in the rehab. He con- ended up confessing to the crime and. We have some of that confession that we can play for you guys. It's it's very sad. It's over an hour long, so there's no way to play it all. But his confession is is different than what a vet had said. He said that Stephen FaceTimed him to get some weed. Mm. That's why he picked him up. And that he went to the woods to sell some weed. That he was afraid of Stephen because of his mood swings. Okay. There was a scuffle. And so he shot him in the stomach. And then he did the last two shots to make sure his best friend was dead. 
police believe there was a scuffle, but they believe it was Stephen realizing that Andrew was pulling out a gun mm -hmm. and he tried to protect himself. I mean, it was dark. I don't know everything, but after the murder, Andrew did drive around for a while, which is why Stephen's phone, if you remember, was That's pinged right. in Detroit and then it was pinged in Sterling Heights. Eventually, he ended up throwing it in the dump in a dumpster. In his confession, he ma makes no mention of wanting to visit Nancy's grave, only that they were going to sell pot. Like, why are you selling pot to your best friend at yeah. three in the morning at Nancy's grave? Yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Here's a little snippet of his confession. To imagine spot, because I figured I could just leave, like, my friend, like, I can't just leave him out in the cold. I can't just, sure, I can't just do that. Yeah. So, I tried to, we tried, I tried, I thought, and my thought was, I can't leave him here. He deserves better than that. I don't know what else to do. I can't move a full body by myself. And so me and her, we went and we, we cut from, I don't know, the waist. Touched through that with we'll, we'll her, her, she, which is, she swung at it with an axe. She felt her death? Yeah. And then, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, well, why would she do that? Of, of bringing the, his body back to your house? 
quantity of you on top of her. I mean, that's something I couldn't just, yeah, I didn't want to just leave. Why did you really serve the job in the halfway? Why didn't you decide to think a whole lot? I figured we can't move a whole lot. Okay. A trial was held eventually, and a vet testified against Andrew. Andrew's defense tried to claim diminished capacity. Mm. But in Michigan, it's not allowed as a defense. They were still trying to argue that, and they were trying to argue self-defense because he's claiming that he was afraid of Stephen, even though Stephen wasn't armed. I was going to say, if you have a self-defense... If that's your defense, you have to be threatened with some yeah, something some that your hard. life is yeah your your life's yeah, in danger yeah. like and Stephen's unarmed and I mean Andrew has the gun so really that self defense doesn't hold water with me. Well, in the end, he was not found guilty of premeditated murder. Okay, he was found guilty of second degree murder. And he was sentenced to a minimum of 52 years in prison, which, so you know, so you know, was beyond the sentencing guidelines. Oh, it was. It was. Wow. Mm -hmm. The judge, whom we know, stated, quote, you destroyed not only Stephen's life, his family and friends, you destroyed your family's life as well as your own. And the judge said, for 13 months, you let everyone wallow in fear and in distress and that there was hope that he might be well that's the worst part of it even after they found steven you still showed no remorse for killing your friend and didn't he post like on social media and stuff like yes oh Oh, i miss miss you you. i miss you so much oh where is my friend right right he helped distribute posters for his friend at sentencing andrew spoke He was crying, and he said, I have nightmares. I take full responsibility. Stephen was, I miss him so much. I'm just so sorry. Such a waste, such a senseless crime. Yeah. It's just so sad. Well, Yvette ended up doing well for herself, and she went to college, and uh, I believe she got probation or something like that. Mm. And... She ended up recovering from this and making something of her life. Last I knew when I looked her up. But the pain that the family, both families feel is so strong still in this local area. And it's just so shocking um, that it still affects me Mm -hmm. right now. This is a terrible story. I do remember when it happened as well, but... Just for 13 months, they didn't know where he was at. And the whole time, his best friend... I know. ...knew his body was out there. I mean, in your own... And in his own backyard. I mean, like I said, maybe he... And his parents. Maybe he just wanted to be reminded of what he did. I don't know. But... I know there I mean I feel bad for everyone's yeah, parents. This is, this is just so like I said, it's just senseless and it makes it's not that, you know, crimes a lot of crimes have a reason why people do crazy stuff, right? I mean But this was this is just nothing. Like just because I don't know. Like I, how terrible. And the betrayal Stephen had to have felt yeah. in the last minute of his life. Yeah, right. This is terrible. Anyway. Anyway, well, thanks, Talia. You're welcome. For, the, for that one. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Yeah, we appreciate listening. you guys watching and listening. And again, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. Lovely co-host. <laughs> if you guys want to hear more, we have a Patreon. It's called Patreon. You go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes, and you can get audio. We have what? How many? One billion? Two billion? Yeah, there's about two billion extra episodes. Extra episodes. <laughs> and they're all commercial free. Plus, you get episodes like this, early release with no commercials, and lots of amazing things. Yeah, a we sticker. Have a, yeah, we have a you, Facebook group. So yeah, check it out. Face, yeah, you get to be part of the Facebook group. We also, you can subscribe through Apple um, to our podcast and get the same ad free 
early releases and unreleased to the public episodes. We have a website, crimesconsequences.com. We have some good merchandise. Mm -hmm. One says, I hate people. Yeah, that's my favorite. One says, dead inside. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're just like, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's just all kinds of, check it out. Check Check it it out. out. Just check it out. Go to our website, check it out. (laughs) You're so cute. (laughs) Thank you again for listening. Uh, Again, don't write some nasty comments because we will get back to you on that. You know, it happens. Comment on the commenters coming up. People love it, but whatever, whatever. It's not going to stop us from doing our podcast. No, so so keep, keep on keeping on with that. But for all you guys that have posted really nice comments, we want to thank you for taking the time to help us out. And for any new people, thank you for checking us out and giving us a chance. We appreciate it. Yeah, we love you guys. Until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.